Okay, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk today uh, about <clears throat> our, one of the most recent, uh, like large implementations in MD, uh, namely the, the, the QMMM interface of MD. Uh, this was an kind of an old request in the MD. Uh, every time we would run a, a survey, that was just typically one of the things that would top in the like, would top the list in terms of how many people wanted this feature. And we decided to start working on that a few years ago. And we finished, like it was released in 2018, if I'm not wrong, or late 2017, but I think it was 2018. And the idea that we had was to create a tool that was as complete as possible to avoid like, like basically to allow people to do anything they want and avoid any kind of, uh, oh, I have to use this tool or that tool, changing tools because uh, different methods were available only in one software or another. Uh, you can learn more about the QMM interface in our website, like in the, in the KS website slash research slash QMM. Okay, so one of the cool things about doing that in MD VMD is that VMD is an amazing tool for rendering images. Uh, we we were like when we were implementing the tool. When we were implementing, can you? When we were implementing that uh, tool into NMD, we also thought about like not making just a NMD tool, but making a, a NMD VMD suite kind of tool. And so we implemented tools, like part of the tools in the NMD side, part of the tools in the VMD side. Uh, the cool side of EMD, you can have this amazingly nice orbital renderings that you can see here in the screen. And with the newest version of EMD that, that's being released now that can even be done uh, using RTX and VRTX cards, you can do that live. It's not even a rendering, extra rendering step anymore. Uh, okay, so NMD was already uh, famous for doing many things and like we tried to make them NMD a good tool for enzymology. That was what the end what we were trying. Uh, so NEMG was famous for first doing large system like this system here, which was simulated by my colleague Pompeiria de Linois, and who's not here in Delaware. Uh, like so, NEMG was famous for being extremely scalable, uh, like would basically scale linearly in thousands of computer nodes. Had always had some like a decent level of GPU acceleration, it's particularly true for the newest version like NEMG three, uh, like molecular dynamics flexible feeding. And enhanced sampling algorithms. You saw all of this this week, you know, like this is the last talk. So you have seen like many of these tools uh, during the week. And also had a very good easy interface with VMD. So the, the, the thing that we implemented was a comprehensive QMM tool. And that was done together with, uh, of course, like led by Klaus Schulten like a few years ago. And that was like when we started, like he, he, he was part of it. And of course, he ended up passing away during the time we were working on it. Um, so when you simulate the system, so you want to simulate, of course, the whole box. Let's say you have here a, a huge box with like about 300,000 atoms here in this case, but you might have a region there, like let's say that the molecule that is there, the ligand, that you want to treat with quantum, mechanic, quantum mechanical uh, methods for some reason. Uh, this reason can be varied. like. In enzymology, we talk about enzymology because a lot of the time you want to do, you want to study chemical reactions. You want to study hydrolysis of a linker, you of a molecule. You want to study uh, like many processes that might be happening there that involve breaking or forming chemical bonds. However, it can be used for many other things. So my, my personally, my first paper using uh, my first work, like using using QMMM, was actually to study how membrane uh, like lipids in the membrane would influence the charges of a molecule that is polarized in the membrane. So you can also study polarization effects with that. Uh, there are, like right now we are using it to better represent calcium in a situation where the force fields fail. So there are other things that you can do with QMM. It's not just for breaking and forming bonds. So how the QMM named the interface works? Uh, the, the software has uh, basically, what you do, you have a, a system. Let's say you have a system here that is like a hundred thousand atoms, a million atoms, doesn't matter. And then you're gonna simulate part of the system in a in a in a quantum mechanical region. That part of the system is gonna be treated by a quantum mechanics software that can be like in this example here, Orca. 
So these atoms here inside, they're simulated by Orca. The atoms outside of that area, that, but they're still nearby, they're still a certain radius, they become a charge point in space for solving your quantum mechanical equations. So what happened is they polarize the, the, the quantum mechanical population. They're there in the space, they form the spaces, but they are not, they're, they're just charges in space. They don't move, they're not atoms, okay? So that makes the quantum calculation relatively cheap compared to simulating everything with quantum mechanics, because this is just one small term in your, in your Hamiltonian when you're solving this. Uh, the rest of the system is treated by NAMD directly. So NAMD calculate the, the, the forces the same way you would do in a classical mechanics. And then NAMD gets back all the information from the, like basically the force gradients, like what, what, where this atom should move from the quantum mechanical equation, the energy and things like that. When it gets back to NAMD, NAMD put everybody together into the same system, calculate the, inter the, the interactions at the interface that, that you might need to calculate, there are methods for doing that, and we're gonna talk about them, and then gives a molecular dynamic step. The molecular dynamic step is the same as a classical one, you're basically doing, in, 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 uh, in, in this case, you're basically doing a, uh, it's, a it's a Borkenheimer kind of dynamics. So you assume that the nuclei are moving independently of the, uh, the electric cloud, okay? That's how you do it. Like we did that together with collaborators, of course, in the quantum part. Um, Gerd Rocha from Brazil, uh, from, uh, from Paraíba in Brazil, he is one of the leaders that implemented uh, leader PI is like implementing a GPU version for MOPAC for semi empirical calculation. He's well known in the semi empirical field. So, for like most of the time in, in, in biological simulations, semi empirical is more than enough, like it's, it's enough for simulating your system. And also, it's fast enough so that you can sample more. So, like, it was very good to work with him. And Frank Neze in Germany, like from the Max Planck in Germany, he's uh, it's, a, it's a, the main developer of Orca, so like he's the award leading uh, quantum chemist in the higher level kind of uh, methodology where you need more details, more accuracy from your QM uh, methods. I've been having a lot of allergies this day, sorry. Um, so, we work together with them also because we want to make sure that we would also not create a tool that seemed correct for biophysicists like us, but was not so precise for the quantum chemists. Yeah, okay, how this works. Uh, if you want to use our QMM interface, there are two native uh, programs that you can use. MOPAC for semi empirical calculation and ARCA that works for semi empirical. It's slower than the MOPAC version, so I, I would use MOPAC if you want to do semi empirical. You can also do heart refock, you can do DFT, you can do MP2, like perturbation kind of methods, and many more methods, like you can do using Orca. Uh, also, we have a custom interface that is a scripted interface that you can use for basically any kind of software, even your own QM software. And that's, uh, what, what it does is it, it provides an interface with, like basically it, it gives all the information in a, the full kind of format for people to use with like about the gradients, the forces, the positions, everything that you need for QM calculation and expect that in a specific format back. So what this script interface does, like we provide already some scripted example for Gaussian, QCAM and TerraCAM. This is, this software, they are, like we already give an interface so that you can use, or you can use an example to create your own. Also, at the end of the day, basically what you're doing is NAMG sends this information, this block of element information. These are actually position elements and point charges to the QM software. And the QM software sends back force gradients, charges, and energy. So, and that you continue this loop for a long time. Another interesting thing is like, because we created this interface for NAMG, uh, Raleigh Group, uh, they developed uh, a tool, like basically they developed an interface, like a Python, one of these Python interface to use ANI, which is a AI interface for an AI software to calculate DFT uh, property, like basically calculate DFT using AI instead of really calculating the DFT uh, for, for many quantum chemistry, like many atoms, like you, you cannot do for everything, but it works for many atoms, many different atoms. Okay, so how do we connect then the QM and the MM region? 
The most common way of doing that is with a link atom, and that's what we did. What a link atom is, like imagine that you have this molecule, this part is your QM region, this is your classical, this is your classical region. And this QM region, uh, like at the interface, if, if this is gonna be treated with quantum mechanics, you need to somehow uh, finish this bond here, otherwise you're gonna have an open bond there that you, you, you can, like, it's gonna influence all your class, all, all your quantum population. So what you do, you add a hydrogen atom here in the QM region. But the classical calculation does not see the Q, this hydrogen atom. In, the, in, in this classical simulation, that atom does not exist. So what you're doing then, you actually add this hydrogen atom in the position that normally a hydrogen atom would be, like the distance that the hydrogen atom would be. And then you would basically calculate every time you're doing a step, you add a hydrogen, you remove this hydrogen for the classical part, and you use uh, and you redistribute to the force over the hydrogen atom to the bond. So like to the, to the, for instance, this link, this link between the carbon and the alpha carbon of the, of, of the, of the, on the, on the backbone of, of, a, of a protein. So that's what you're going to do. You're going to redistribute the forces there so that at the end, you can make the force over the hydrogen that you calculated from the QM being part of both the alpha carbon and the other carbon. Okay. Also, you can imagine that if you're doing that, this hydrogen atom now is gonna have a charge. And this other calcium here before the classical one, so this is the classical, this is the quantum, the classical calcium also has a charge. So what do you do then? You redistribute that charge. There are different ways of doing that. You know, like this is your system that you had before. This is the quantum part, this is the classical part. You can add the hydrogen atom here and just delete that uh, the, the extra calcium when you're doing the QM calculation. And this is what like Gaussian suggests. This is one of the methods, the softer Gaussian. Uh, that's uh, they call it the Z1 method where you have this atom here, like what was your, the previous calcium here, it's not gonna be here. And you're gonna have the hydrogen here and all the other atoms are just gonna have their own charges that you're gonna use as point charges in space. Z2, you do that until the second neighbor, same idea, you just, remove these items from the QM calculation, like the, the items, what I mean here is like the point charges from, like the charges from them. Z3, same thing, but like the, all the three layers out of, out of that uh, hydrogen. So all these atoms are gonna be just like a space, like it's gonna be a vacuum. And, and that's how, like this is the typical way you can do that. Like that's what Gaussian suggests you to do. Uh, there are more sophisticated methods, like uh, the, what, there's the charge shifting method and there's this charge shifting method, what you do is, you take the charge of that carbon and you redistribute that into the next neighbors and you make it in a way that you form a polarization here. So you redistribute part of the charges in different parts, in different spaces there, so that you form a polarization here that would mimic what would be a bond here before. Same thing on the other side. Same idea, redistribution charge density, like what you're gonna have is, you're gonna have the same thing but instead of having three points, you add two points and then you're gonna also for, like polarize that region. The charge shifting scheme is what uh, like Frank Maisy from Orca, and he's very careful about the, 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 the level of accuracy. That's one of the one he suggested us to use, but like all of them are available in like it's, this is like religion, you pick your own and, and, and be happy with it because like it's, it's, there's a lot of fight which one is the best method. I can tell you that we tested which one would be how much the methods would vary, and they vary quite a lot. So what we did was to check, what we did was to check, uh, sorry, there's somebody calling me. What we did was to check how much uh, the charge in a specific atom, so like we went there, calculated the charge on the hydrogen, one atom and leak atom with this hydrogen here or the other hydrogen. And we saw how much the charge with that atom would be depending on the method you're using. And as you can see here, Depending on the method that you're using, you're gonna get completely different results. So this charge shifting, the RCD, the, the Z1, Z2, Z3, all of them are gonna give a different charge for that hydrogen. Your obvious question would be like, which one is the correct one? We don't know. This is not something that you can measure experimentally. This is not something that you, so like, I just can tell you that they are different. You know, they, they give you different results for these different charges. And that's it. Basically, you, you have to pick the one that you find more appropriate. And we tried that with many different other schemes that you have in, in MD and showing that they actually vary quite a lot. And like, like the charge can be plus zero two to minus zero two. You know? So it, it is a big difference if you consider, if you imagine like this, this system. 
what else? Uh, anyway, this was done for, using RCAP in the B3 lib 631G3 uh, G star star. That was done in the QMMMD for five picoseconds with a 0 0.5 femtosecond time scale for a three alanines, so only three alanines there. Another important thing is uh, many uh, QM codes out there, the QMMM codes out there, one of the main things that is talked like when you see this code, and if you read uh, the paper when they implemented the interface for the QMMM interfacing in, in Amber, you're going to see that they discussed a lot about that because they tested how much these softwares could conserve energy, like how the software were available at the time. And, and, and it was horrible, you know, like many of them actually diverged the energy quite a lot after a few picoseconds of MD simulation. And so Amber did a great job in terms of trying to work that to work so that the, the energy would be conserved. And we, we picked that idea and we did the same thing with NAMG. So if you look here, this is the energy conservation. Like you can see here how much your energy is changing for a QQM, alanine, like doing the QMM simulation here, like using MG, doing with MOPAC and ORC, you can see that the energy is pretty stable. So this is just the delta energy. We take the energy from the beginning and see how much it changes. Uh, so it's pretty stable. Same thing if we do the three alanine, where there is a QMM bond here, which is just QM, here's QMM. And there's like one of the alanines is QM, the other two are classical. And you can see that this oscillates, but it's still around zero. Same thing here, it oscillates, but it's still around zero. Or this is for ORCA, HF, uh, for Hartree Fock, like with a small base set. Again, same thing for QM, uh, for three alanine in water. You're going to see that it's quite stable. It's quite stable in both cases. And this is for 50 picoseconds. And then we did a pure QM for a, largely, a slightly larger molecule, like a um, NMA. And we did that for both 0 0.5 femtosecond time step or 2 femtosecond time step. And we simulated that for 10 to the, 5 to the 10 to the 7 steps, which is like in the 2 femtosecond time step, that's, that's 100 nanoseconds of simulation. And this is like 25 nanoseconds of simulation. You can see that's pretty stable. If we consider like the energy drifts, you can see that our energy drifts are really small. And if you compare that to Ember, they are in the same order of magnitude. Ours is a little bit better most of the time, but it's about the same order of magnitude. I wouldn't say that ours is actually better. It's, it is kind of the same. Okay. Uh, what else? Okay, uh, so this is all like part of like what the QMM we implemented and like in terms of the methods and like how this is precise in terms of procedure, making sure that the energy is conserved and things like that. If you have any questions about that, please interrupt me. You know, like this is, it's better if you interrupt me than if you wait until the end. But this is what, what I talked so far is basically what is this interface, how it works in terms of conserving the energy and the methods that we have implemented there. No questions? Okay. We don't have questions. Moving forward, uh, one interesting thing about the NAMD interface is that we made it in a way that would allow you to do a lot of different protocols. You could use a lot of different protocols in doing your QMM. For instance, uh, and also not just that, also to make it easier to use. Uh, usually doing QMM simulation is not easy. Like for many, for, for like I did it myself many years ago when I was doing my PhD before any of these modern tools. And, and it was a nightmare to select what part is the QM, what part is the MM, like adding the hydrogen, adding the, even the, the, the demi atoms, like this hydrogen, you would have to add by hand. All of that is pretty complicated, hard to do, hard to decide. And what we tried to do was like make something easier, especially because we have BMD. So we integrated most of these steps into PCMD. It's very easy to use to select the QM region. You can select the atoms that you want. You can select the methods out through there, and then you can simulate. It's, it's much, much easier than any other tool that I know, honestly. Uh, so the idea behind was you're going to be able to use QuickMD, go step by step, create your simulation, create a structure, do everything classical mechanics, and, and, and minimize the structure where you have water, everything equilibrated. Then select your QM region and start the QMM simulation. If you if you get to a point where, let's say you want to simulate a ligand and you don't want to parameterize for this initial part because it's a complicated thing, you know, like parameterize is never easy. The, the QMM interface, knowing that you want to do a, a QMM, sorry, the QMD interface, knowing that you want to do a QMM simulation can offer you a dummy parameter set for that molecule, for like the ligand. 
And then what it does is it frees that part in space so that part is not going to move until you actually start a QM simulation. So that way you avoid artifacts there and then you make sure that everything else is working correctly. You're, you're minimizing the water, you're minimizing the rest of the structure, equilibrating everything. Before you start the QM simulation, like you don't have to use the expensive QM calculation to do that equilibration step, but also you don't create any problems with your molecule that is in the pocket there that you don't have good parameters for. Okay. QMD also offer a nice analysis, can show orbitals, can, you can visualize all of that like in the, Q, in the, in the QMM interface of, of, Quick, uh, of QMG. You, here is how you select. If you come here, they select, for instance, NMA. I'm going to select that as the QM atom. You come here, you can select the, you can create the dummy parameters if you want. Here are how you select the parameters. You basically are going to have the molecule there. You're going to be saying, like, I just want to generate the topology for me, and it does for you. It's pretty simple. In the analysis part, you can see the orbitals, how they, how they look like. And you can also see how they behave over time. You can see how much they change, what's the energy there. You can check how quickly the energy gap between home and lumen orbitals. You can see all of that during the simulation. And you can also render nice images with like in videos, like with the QM like representation there. Uh, another very interesting part is not just we decided to make this easy to use, but also easy to mix and match with other NAMD tools. Uh, NAMD is very powerful, and the QM software that we connect to is also very powerful. So why not allowing as much as possible for you to use all the methods from NAMD and all the methods for the QM software? And that's what we're trying. So you can use most of the enhanced sampling techniques with QM interface. I say mostly here because we didn't test all of them, but like in principle, you could use any of them. Uh, you can also combine collective variables module of NAMD with the QMMM. Like you had a talk this week, like you had a whole day this week about free energy methods and enhanced sampling methods on Tuesday, right? Like, uh, and you talked to the specialists about that. So you can use all those methods to get with the QMMM interface. And that's actually very important because if you want to study a chemical reaction, if you want to study how a system behaves, like, like if you want to study how an a, a enzyme works, that's, that's what you need to do. Because a lot of the times, uh, the, the biological models, like if you want to cross a barrier like and you're talking about movements a large scale movements like you like you like a model showing like in a channel like you can open and close like in a in, in a in a transporter like the, like like a model works uh, you can see these large scale movements you you need to have sampling methods to jump from one space to another it's the same thing for chemical reaction and also the not important part is a lot of the times if we think about the qm part we we typically like chemists, most of the time, think about doing calculating the most precise way of getting delta H, so getting the energy as correct as possible. However, biological systems, entropy is very important. So you need to sample more and more because a lot of the times the barrier is not in the delta H, it's in the delta S. You know, it is in the in entropy term. So in other words, what you have is we go the simple case. You have a chemical reaction. You want to go from two states. You want to go from state A to state B, and that can be a bond breaking. That can be whatever you were studying here, like in the QM level, or also in the classical level. It's the same idea. You want to connect the two. You want to go from point A to point B. How do you do that? There are so many paths. There's so many ways you can do it, but there is one that is easier, right? So you need to find that easier path. So and assembly methods do exactly that. So you can use these methods then and combine them with QM calculations. You can do stochastic sampling. You can do replicate change. That's going to basically give you more energy so that you can jump between the, the, the barriers. In the stochastic sampling, you jump randomly around and try to find the better conformation. You can also use metadynamics kind of method where you, you feel the potential else. You, know, like you, you make sure that you don't revisit those points. Uh, ABF is a method that's somewhat similar to that that you had a lecture this week. The difference is the metadynamics go in the energy space while the ABF goes in like in a force space. Uh, but it's basically you're doing the same thing. You avoid resampling. Uh, these large scale movement, like I say, they're very common. You're gonna have them also in the, in, in the enzymes. It's not that the chemical reactions are happening and then all the rest is frozen. No, it's actually all moving at the same time. A lot of the times the force cause, like, like maybe the torque of this movement from the uh, enzyme also influences how much energy you need for breaking the, the bones in the, in the chemical reaction. So it's all, everything is working at the same time. You need to consider that. And that's why these tools are so powerful when you use QMM rather than just QM. So 
the case that we tested, and I'm going to show how important this method is, how powerful it is, we decided to look at the setting of the genetic code, uh, like you're studying the tRNA synthetase. Just one for a minute. Uh, what you have is this glutamyl tRNA synthetase is a, is a molecule that binds to tRNA and also to ATP, okay? Uh, and a glutamic acid here in this case, because it's the glutamyl tRNA synthetase. It, it can be other amino acids. What it does, it charges the tRNA with that amino acid at the end. So it binds to the tRNA, then it binds to the ATP and also the uh, glutamic acid here. The, the first step of the reaction is that the glutamic acid binds to the ATP, releasing two phosphates here, and you actually become a, a, a glutamyl AMP, so like it's a monophosphate in this case. Then you're gonna charge, you're gonna give this uh, glutamyl to the tRNA, so it's gonna be bound to the tRNA, and then you're gonna release AMP and then release this uh, charged um, uh, tRNA from the system. So there are many steps here. And we, like you, you can use molecular dynamics to study all of them. It's just, you need to use different tools to study different steps. If you want to study the binding, you're gonna need probably either a, a, a method that can sample for a very long time, or you're gonna need some sort of binding tool to do that, like some docking tool to do that. You can study this next steps here also with docking tools. Then you might study this part here also with QMM where this, this reaction here occurs. You can use uh, then QMM together with enhanced sample methods to study these steps here, which would be the one we did. Then you can use just classic OMD with enhanced sampling methods to see how long it's gonna take for the AMP to leave. And the same thing for the TRNG. You can study all this process using the tools that, that NAMG offer, NAMG and BMD. Okay, so let's look at these steps specifically here. The ones that are more important to use QMM. So we have, this is the system. This is the glutamyl tRNA synthetase. This is the tRNA. We prepared two QM regions for this system. And that's another thing that is kind of unique of NMD. Uh, it's not the first software to do that, but it's the first large MD engine to do that, that you can actually have more than one QM region. So in this case, we have one QM region in the glutamyl tRNA synthetase and, uh, sorry, in the, in the, anti region, so the reading part of like where you're reading the tRNA and the other part where you're charging it. So like the, the, the reaction center where the chemical reaction occurs is the other one. And also use a method for uh, allosteric communication calculation to see how information is transferred from one place to another. Okay. At the chemical reaction part, we like in the other step here, we look at how the AT, so this is the, the part of the tRNA, so the, the last uh, base, the last uh, group of the tRNA, how that's bound to the glutamine, and that's what we did here in different steps. And also we look using two different things. So we look if it would bind to the two prime oxygen or the three prime oxygen. These are also questions that are not known the answer. Like that's one of the things we did to, to figure that out. Uh, there are experimental results showing both cases for different tRNA synthetases. So like, uh, uh, glutamine tRNA synthase binds my bind to one more frequently, or, or like other organisms might bind different ones, or other, um, uh, other amino acids would be in a different position, like the O2 or 3. You know, like, so we, we, we tried to look at which one was the case for the glutamine tRNA synthase, which was an open question at the time. Then to do that, we combine the QMM2 with steer molecular dynamics string methods and also extended ABF so to, to study these interactions. The first step then, we use steer molecular dynamics in the QMM calculation. We modify the, 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 the SMD algorithm a little bit so that instead of pointing in X, Y, or Z like you typically do in an SMD simulation, this is the QM SMD where you always point in the direction of the other atom. Basically what you're saying is like, I can have a SMD where I say this atom should move close to this one and with a specific force and that's gonna go in that direction and then it's gonna stop moving as soon as you get your threshold. Like if you are one angstrom apart, you don't need force anymore. You don't do that with one angstrom, you do that with a two or 2.5. So if you get close, like if you're forming the bond already, you can let it go by itself. So the idea is to force chemical reactions to occur. Okay. So we did that. So at the end, what you're doing with that is you're forcing going from point A to point B 
as brutally as possible. You know, like you basically go straight. You know, like you you pretend that there are no mountains there in this crossing of the Alps here. Okay, the same idea is the one that we used to study, uh, like that I mentioned earlier in this week that I studied. You know, like you study uh, adhesion processes from bacteria in in in, uh, in humans. You know, like it's the same idea. It's the same method. It's the same kind of pathway. You try to calculate what is the closest possible pathway, and you try to lock that pathway in the case of the, the, the Staphylococcus binding here. But in the in this case here, you want to optimize that as much as possible to reduce the energy, not increase the energy. Okay. How the file looks like, how this SMD file look like, you're gonna give atom one, atom two. So like I'm gonna bind atom six, seven, nine, six to atom five, four, four, zero. This is the force of the, the, the constant spring, uh, constant of the spring. This is the velocity I'm pulling, and this is the threshold. So like, I want to be, I want to move this guy close to this one with this K here for the spring. This is the velocity I'm pulling, and if it gets to 2.5 inch apart, stop doing it. And okay? same thing here for different atoms. And that's what we did. And by doing that, we are, what we're trying to do is to find the ideal path for you, trying to get this one here. However, like when you're just doing the SMD, you're going straight. How do we find the, the ideal pathway? So we decided to use the string method. And the string method, what you do is you basically try to minimize, you start from that bad pathway from the SMD, you try to minimize uh, the route, like finding the easiest path. You specifically, you need to do first is to create a, a define a collective variable space. And then what we did was, so imagine that all these atoms here are involved. So in the chemical reaction, so this is the glutamine, this is the AMP part here, like this is the phosphate. What you're gonna do, you're gonna create collective variables that connect everybody here that can go closer and, and farther away from each other. So there are many of them. And then we track all of them over time. So when you do that, you're gonna see what is the distance between this glutamine, this carbon here to this other oxygen, this carbon to this other oxygen. And, and you're gonna see what is the distance during the SMD simulation. Then you're gonna divide that in space. You're gonna have this your initial position, this is your final one. You're gonna have intermediates that are from the SMD. And you're gonna use that to launch simulations from there. And then what you do in the string is you basically start simulations from each one of these steps, do short simulations, First, unbiased, then you bias them a little bit, trying to find where is the local minima. And then you do that multiple times. And you release many replicas at the same time. So you allow the system to explore, but very little. Like it's a short amount of time, just like 100 steps. And then you stop, push everybody together again, try to find a, a kind of stable conformation. Like when you say stop here, it's, more, it's not stopping, it's actually uh, adding a constraint. And then you hold, and then you do unconstrained again, and then you hold and do unconstrained again. And by doing that, you end up finding the easiest path that is nearby. So you're going to find local minima, and then you're going to find better minima, because what happened is you're all together. They're all connected into a string. The nice thing about being connected to the string is that the string method also tries to make them kind of equidistant. So you're not going to be trapped. Everybody's going to be trapped into the same valley. You're going to force it to form to, to find the whole pathway because you want them to be equidistant from each other like in this collective variable space. So when you do that, and this is how we did like, so we are tracking all this uh, uh, collective variables. You can see how they look like here and you can see how they look like over these images. And these images are basically the time of the reaction. So you can imagine this is the, it's not time, it's actually the, the, the collective variable space of the reaction. So this is before reaction, this is at the end of reaction. So you can see that this bond gets if it gets closer, you form a bond between this blue here is uh, this guy here from this carbon to this oxygen. You're gonna form a bond there. You're gonna break some bonds, you know, like this green one here is going away. So there's this distance going away means that you're breaking that bond. And you're gonna track the other one doing the same thing. So when you do that then, so again, you have the pathway from your SMD. Now you're gonna find another pathway. So you're gonna find a pathway, oops. You're gonna find a pathway that is intermediate, that string is going to optimize there. And if you continue to run the string, you're going to end up find, finding the path that is the most, like the, the, the cheapest pathway for like in terms of energy to, to cross. So we started from the position that I was showing before, this is how you track the distance. 
we end up with this. If you can see here, it's much more smooth, you know, like, because the string is gonna make everything kind of smooth to find the surface, like what, what is the best path that you cross. You don't see any energy here yet. This is how you convergence. You can check the conversion, like how many iterations you need. You're gonna see the all converge start to stop moving basically. And that's when you kind of make sure that you found the, the, the minimal path to make the reaction. Then after that, you're gonna calculate the free energy. So what you do then is if you have a pathway that you know that is a good pathway for this, this reaction to occur, you can sample around this pathway to find what is the energy to cross any barriers that you still have in that pathway. It's never gonna be zero, right? You're gonna have something there. So what you do, you basically pick up your car here and drive around here and try to find how like like how tough that is. You know, like, oh, there's some ramps, there's some, like you're going up some ramps, you're going down someone, there's a big, big hill in the way, you know, like there's no, like there's going to be, like that you're going to be going up very fast, very slowly, or going to be down very fast. So you're going to find these paths, like doing this uh, uh, free energy kind of calculation. To do that, we used ABF, so adaptive biasing force. Adaptive biasing force is a very powerful algorithm that allows you to not resample much the same position. So you're going to pass through the pathways as it was possible, somewhat similar to the metadynamics kind of system that I showed before, the method that I showed before. And so what you're going to do is you're going to have to drive through this pathway to make sure what the energy is. You're going to have to drive through this highway here connecting A to B thousands of times. You're just going to have to go back and forth so that you can make sure what is the energy landscape look like. One advantage of a new version of the ABF that you have now is that you can do that instead of doing that yourself, you can get a thousand friends and do each one with your own car and drive around all together. So when you do that, you're actually sampling the space with many walkers and these walkers then can be run independently. What that means, you can use supercomputers and that's the part that we liked in doing that. So basically at the end, you, want, you have this tunnel that it was formed by the string like you need to walk on that part, you know that that's the valley that you need to walk inside. And then you're gonna release uh, uh, ABF walkers that are gonna drive around and you're gonna check around what the, 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 this area looks like. And you're gonna calculate the energy for you, the, 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 yeah, the energy for you, the barrier. And you're gonna get a reaction, like you're using a reaction coordinate, you're gonna get your free energy barrier to cross this path. Like I say, the nice thing about it, doing this with the extended ABF method that you can parallelize is that you can actually parallelize it pretty well. So this is us running, this is the number of picoseconds per day we can send with the QMMM, and this is the number of processes that we are using. So if you go, you can use thousands of processors, like you can use thousands of nodes at the same time and be very efficient because the communication between these cars is small. So these cars are talking to each other, they're telling each other where they are, what's the cost of that space is, but that's a very cheap kind of communication compared to parallelizing the calculation where you calculate part here, part there. This is like, this is basically the same system being calculated many, many times with a small, oh, this is, I, I already checked this part here, that's the end, you don't need to go there, you know, like, and that's basically how it's done. So the communication is small and then the, the parallelism is perfect and you can use supercomputers to do that. Oh, back here, sorry. So what that means is, uh, what that means is it becomes very cheap to call in terms, it's expensive in terms of total computer costs, but it's cheap in terms of like this, you can get the free energy pathway, you can get the free energy value, the reaction there in just a couple of days because you're using a lot of resources at the same time. And so you can parallelize that a lot. So we did that, we checked the free energy landscape for four different cases for four different types of reaction. And we check, you can see all of them here. And then we found the one that was with the, the smallest barrier. When we checked the one with the smallest barrier was this one here. And then what you do, like you're gonna see that this is the, how it looks like the system is kind of stable in the free energy here. And then you're gonna go up. So that means you're gonna have a barrier to cross. You go down a little bit, you get another barrier. And then you go down a little bit and go, go the way to here. One interesting thing of that result when we got just this part was that this process looks it looks wrong you need energy and this was supposed to be exergonic and you should you're supposed to lose energy in this process like it should be better to be in the other side than on this side but that happens actually because as soon as you finish the chemical reaction you are not you have this phosphate not solvated 
Like if you, that, that's right after the chemical reaction. And actually solving the phosphate is an important step. You need to solve the phosphate so that your energy costs, your energy is gonna drop because like you're, you're basically saying that the entropic penalty here is huge. So you need this other part. So then we did this other part using an ABF, but just in MM, we didn't do QMMM here because it would be too expensive. And what we did was to check the distance between the phosphate going away from the reaction center and then solvating it. So like you have a system where this phosphate here in the middle, you're solvating it and that's the distance we're tracking. And then you're gonna see that as soon as you start to go away from that distance that was there in the beginning, right after the, right after the rupture, the energy would drop significantly very fast. So what that means is as soon as you solvate, the whole process becomes exergonic. And then what you have is the, the delta, delta delta G here from here to here can be calculated. And that was in the order of 10 to 15 uh, K copper mole, which was experimental value known. And also the barrier here was similar to what we expected from experiments as well. So all of these agree with the experimental results that we knew at the time, were known at the time. Uh, since I have no questions so far, I have to say that a great work comes with great movies. And this is how this simulation looks like. You're gonna be able to see here how the reaction occurs. So I summarize everything that I was showing. You have the tRNA there. You have this anticoagulant region and you have the reaction center on the other side. You have a steric pathway communicating the two parts and we calculated that too. And this I'm just showing the system to you a little bit. You can see how the molecule looks like. Um, soon you're gonna see that in the reaction center, I'm gonna show the molecules that are there. That's one of the QM regions. There you go. So that's one of our QM regions. And you're gonna zoom in there. So these were the atoms that were treated with using quantum mechanics. What you're seeing here are already some of the orbitals. So this is already some of the highest occupied molecular orbitals. I'm marking here what part is the AMP, what part is the glutamyl, and what part is the tRNA. So this is the three prime oxygen, which was the one we found to be, oops, sorry, which was the one we found to be the lowest energy. Let me go back here. The one we found should be the, the, the lowest energy like barrier the one to, to cross. And now you're gonna see what happened in the simulation. I'm gonna just show you the system a little bit. You can see how the system looks like. All these videos, by the way, are done with DMD. It's, it's not so complicated to render videos like that. And here you go, you can see the dynamics of the system. You're gonna see, but well, you have these dashed lines here, I'm just showing them. They are not doing anything in the simulation. They're just here to show you to make it easier for you to look at the right place, you know, so that you can see, oh, well, that's the reaction that you're expecting to happen. So this hydrogen first is gonna attack this oxygen. You're gonna see the hydrogen binding to that oxygen from the AMP. That was the first small barrier they have there. Then the second barrier is to break this bond here between oxygen and the carbon and form this other bond between the glutamyl and the, the oxygen there. And see this one is going away, this one is starting to bind, and then you go down here from there, that's when you stabilize the system, and that's the final part of that chemical reaction, the QM. And at the same time, you can see all the orbitals, how they're moving at the same time here. <clears throat> uh, from here on, after that, we did the classical simulation where you see this going away and being solvated, which would then make the whole process uh, exergonic. This is going away, and that's it. Um, we also use the same methodology to study other systems. We use this to study the mechanism of DASC, uh, biotransformation that happens in the human gut, like for this enzyme, DASC. We This enzyme binds to cortisol, and then DASC converts this cortisol into 20 alpha, 20 alpha dihydrocortisol, which uh, is associated with uh, prostate cancers uh, and also some uh, immunity problems. And also like some of these enzymes are connected to these enzymes. So these enzymes activate another one, this connection to hypertension that is connected to prevention of colon cancer. And also like, my, like they're basically, like they, they influence the growth of microbes uh, in, your, in your microbiome. Uh, they, they influence how their metabolism happens in the, in, the, in, the, in the good microbiome. So all of that is, is somewhat coordinated by this constituent seeding organism that has this enzyme. So this is a very important enzyme to study um, this is the crystal structure that our collaborators got from for this system. This is still not published. Actually, this is uh, was submitted recently. Publication. <clears throat> the 
what we did there, we got the crystal structure. We looked into the system, like inside, we went there to check the crystal. We looked, uh, the crystal was just the A plus structure of the system, so without the, the, the ligand. We did, a, we, we did a check with other systems that were available on the, in the PDB. We bound to the, we, we checked what was bound in the other ones. None of them had the exact same ligands that we wanted, but that helped us to guide the binding of NADH and the cortisol into the catalytic side. And this is how the system looks like at the end when it's bound. To check if the, the binding step was correct, we were able to minimize equilibrate all the system using QMMM. When we did that, we found we found what were the bound, what were the bonds of forming there. And by checking all these bonds, we were able to tell experimentalists what they should mutate to see if they would kill the binding. And that's what they did. So if you mutate these two tyrosines here, what is happening is like you, you your activity drops from 100% to almost nothing. So what that means is like these two amino acids are helping to coordinate the, 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 the cortisol into the pocket. Interestingly, they still bind, the cortisol is still there, but because you don't have that of those amino acids there, what happened is uh, it, it's not in the perfect position where, where it like, would allow this reaction to occur. Then we look into the, react the reaction itself. The mechanism proposed before was just a simple mechanism with like a simple hydrolysis mechanism. That's not what we found. What we observed was that there is no water involved, first of all. The reaction is actually a proton relay. You have one proton jumping to the cortisol from the NADH. So the NADH becomes NAD plus. Um, this proton, uh, sorry, NAD plus becomes NAD, NAD. So NAD, so this proton jumps to the cortisol. The other one coming from the serine here goes to the cortisol. You have a ion in the back there that coordinates this whole area. So make sure that the wire is stable. The, which was thought before that the, uh, the, the it's an, Iron if I'm not wrong, magnesium. I forgot, sorry. Uh, it's a magnesium. The magnesium there would actually stabilize a water molecule so that the water molecule would donate the proton, but that's not what we observed. Then you would have this other hydrogen here from the other part of the NADH jump into the serine. And then this histidine here needs to be protonated and, and then donate the proton to the NAD, stabilize the whole process. Um, if this was correct, you now have all these amino acids here that would influence the, the, the reaction, we can test that. That's exactly what we did later, I'm gonna show you. But first, what we did is use the same methodology to calculate the, the, the chemical reaction. We use SMD, and after the SMD, we did a string calculation, and then these are the reaction paths that we're following. We're checking how they move over time. And we, by doing all of that, we were able to calculate the free energy, and we can see that the delta G here is relatively small. And this is a completely downhill kind of reaction. As soon as you go, we like you really go downhill in all this process. As soon as you cross the first barrier, basically, as soon as you cross the first reaction, the proton relay is very cheap. You know, like all of them go pretty fast one after the other. Uh, then if there's if you we were correct, mutating the serine or mutating this histidine would kill the most of the reaction. This is exactly what happened in the in the experiment. And this is a video that shows exactly what I'm describing. The video shows like all these transitions like in this smooth way. So you're gonna see some crazy intermediate steps just because we were, that was the simplest way to generate a video to look at the system. That's not exactly how it happens because you're moving a lot of shaking at the same time and, and it's not so simple to generate a video like that. So here you have the procedure seedings, the uh, C. That's your reaction center. You can see it. these are the bonds that we're gonna form. So this is the cortisol, the serine, the histidine, and this is the NADH. Oh, there's a zinc, it's not even a magnesium. Sorry about that. There's a zinc ion. And then you have here the chemical reactions. So this is step one, step two, step three, and step four. So there are four reactions happening. And here you go. So what I was saying is like, this is a, it, it's a, it's a smooth video to make it easier for us to see. That's why you're seeing this, Hydrogen here making some crazy shapes, but that's basically what oops, I'm touching my mouse. Sorry. Oh, reaction here. You're gonna see that this first proton jumps there. Then the second one gonna be this one here. And you're 
going to have a third step here and then the fourth one. That shows you like the power of this simulation and how much you can actually study with them in terms of enzymology. And like you can develop like ideas about how reactions occur, and you can also change the, the, the surface around the molecules so that you can influence the energy to make these reactions. In, in summary, what you can do with this QMM interface is you can quickly, like without no ex scripting knowledge or basically no knowledge of QMM, you can use the graphical interface like from QMD to set up a basic classic hybrid and hybrid simulations. Uh, rely on the suggested protocols there, you know, like you can just simulate simple kind of QMM simulations, simple kind of uh, simulating cases, uh, analyze the simulations and visualize the trajectories and molecular orbitals. There's a tutorial for that available for in, like in, in our website, you can, you can download and, and look into it. Not so quickly, you can also do, you are gonna need some scripting knowledge. You can wrap any quantum package code, you know, like you can use your own code if you want for, for doing the simulations. And you can use Jupyter notebooks, like for like Python notebooks, to run and analyze the string method optimization in the EABF. There is a tutorial available for that too, but this is it's a Jupyter notebook tutorial. So like it's a step-by-step -step scripting kind of tutorial that shows you how to simulate and how to get this free energy calculations done. This is not a simple simulation to do. I can tell you right away, you're gonna need a lot of uh, Python skills and also a lot of uh, a lot of uh, installations kind of skill because it's installing all this software like you need to install an MD and uh, okay an MD you can download the binary but you need to install uh, the, the the QM packages in parallel in the right way so that you can call them it, it's it, it's not as simple but it, it, it works and it's beautiful and it's all explained there yeah. it's not just so much for beginners uh, the first tutorial the, the QM uh, sorry the free, QM free energy tutorial that I was just talking about is one in the in the in the notebook uh, it, it works on the OMP decarboxylase. This is a one enzyme that's frequently used to study because it, it has the is the most efficient enzyme that we know. You know, like it's it makes a reaction that would take hundreds of thousands of years maybe to happen and brings it to seconds. You know, like so it's it's a very efficient enzyme. It's here by the way, 78 million years without the enzyme compared to 18 milliseconds with the enzyme. So it's it's the 10 to 17 factor of the catalytization. Which is amazing. So this is an enzyme that we we did here because it's very obvious that you see the results, and it's relatively cheap. You can do that without much a supercomputer to run. Uh, all the results are also there in the tutorial, so you you can start the tutorial and check how the how the results are without actually running the simulations. That helps like in learning, and that basically it. I just want to say thank you to everybody that helped and made this QMM interface happen. Uh, these are the entire crew, like everybody that's in the paper there. Um, you're going to see Sam, some people here that you might know. So like Jim Phillips was the main developer of NEMD2 a few years ago. Uh, uh, Julie was the one who implemented the NEMD3 version that you're seeing this week, a lot of the results. Garrett and uh, Garrett Christopher and, uh, and Nezi are the QM people in this paper, like the quantum chemists. Joao did the interface for QMD. Max helped us in many of the steps, but particularly in making the orbital visualization in VMD. John is the main developer of VMD. Tu, uh, uh, Tu, and I and Marcelo were the leaders in terms of the QM, like how to implement these things into MD. And that's it. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer any of them. Or no. If you don't have any questions, I just have to say thank you all for joining this week, you know, like of, of workshops, right? Like of workshop, I think it was productive. I hope so. And yeah, so there's somebody here already in the, you're more than welcome, no problem.